Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started on the uh, public forum here uh, for uh, all, all board matters, including the resolutions. Um, as, as noted in our agenda, the public forum will begin at 9 o'clock for a maximum of 45 minutes. Individual comments are limited to two or three minutes, depending on the amount of speakers. We, have, we only have seven signed up, so three minutes is fine for the, for the time on this. Um, and uh, if, if individuals wish to share additional information, they may complete a comment card that will be forwarded to the board and made part of the board record. Uh, for, for your information, or everybody watching this public forum, We'll begin 30 minutes prior to the public forum at 8.30 and did close at uh, 9, 9 o'clock a.m. Comments will be taken in the order of sign-ups and, and scheduled speakers must have signed up uh, prior to the when the public forum begins. If individuals have issues that are not within the jurisdiction of the board, TriMet staff will be available to listen to concerns and answer questions 30 minutes prior to the public forum until uh, the start of the business meeting. And also, if something comes up when we hear it from your testimony, we will refer you to staff uh, or have them get with you after the public forum. So with that, I'm going to jump right into the public forum. I'm going to call up two of you uh, at a time. I'm going to call Keith Schultz uh, from Opal and BRU, wants to talk about transfer extension. Uh, we got Bill Wimmer, I believe it is, from ATU, uh, uh, 557, who's a retiree, uh, wants to talk to us about something we're, we're not listening to the public, I think is what he's saying. So come on up. Keith, nice to see you. I know. I haven't been here for a while. Yeah. Thank you for <laughs> allowing me to come here. Uh, yeah, as you know, I'm Keith Schultz, a member of Opal and Bus Riders Unite. And it's been an interesting morning this morning. I live on Powell Boulevard, so I was coming across the Ross, Ross Island Bridge on a bus that, uh, because of the Selwood Bridge being closed for, you know, starting last night, it, uh, it was horrendous. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm here today to speak to you about the transfer extension proposal which was first introduced over three years ago by Bus Riders Unite and over 6,000 <coughs> transit users in the Tri-County area. The current proposal, tabled by the board a year ago, should be put back on the table to be put to an up or down vote at the December TriMet board meeting. Those of us who use single fare tickets and need to use more than one bus or train for our daily tasks would be thankful for this uh, to make our transit experience more effective for everyday use of the system. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to mm -hmm. let you know that if you, want, if you can stay around, we actually will be, be talking under the general manager report, Title VI, Fair Equity Analysis. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the time when we're actually going to talk about that ordinance and decide what we want to do. Oh. And, and I hope we'll get some closure on that. Okay. okay. Sure. All Thank right. You. Thanks. Good morning, Bill. Good morning. Nice to see you again. You too. I'm part of the ATU 757 Retirees Chapter, and we have over 945 dues-paying members. And I feel that speak for those people, and it just seems to bother me that TriMet Board and the general management of TriMet doesn't seem to be listening to their employees and to the general public out there. Because when you start to make all these rail changes and cut bus service, some of these outlying properties, these people are going to be directly affected. And I live in an area which will be served by two different MAX lines. And when they cut the service on the Milwaukee Orange Line, there's going to affect a lot of people in that area from downtown Milwaukee to the 82nd Avenue. Because there are a lot of people that they are not going to have a bus service from Oregon City, from Oregon City to Milwaukee. But what happens to these people that are living from, say, Milwaukee south or north of Milwaukee, you're going to cut off some of their bus service. And that's not going to be very well for these people out there. I know I live in that area. And when you cut that 70, 71, and move them, you're not going to be happy about that. And you're not listening. These you management people just don't seem to get it. And when they did the audit, I've been talking to a lot of the retired people and also a lot of the people that are currently employed. The management staff of this local outfit 
isn't listening to their employees, and if you really want to improve your bus service and your max service, I would suggest that these people that are writing schedules and such get off their butts and get out in the, the public and actually talk to the people out there. You can't run a bus system on a computer. I'm sorry, it just don't work because you have to no allowances for traffic or any kind of disruption in the service. So if you're not, you can't run a schedule that way. These operators are complaining about it, having to get into a bus that has a soil seat or whatever because they don't have any restroom breaks or anything like that. It's pathetic, I'm sorry. And then they cut the cleaning staff at the maintenance department from one, when I was working at TriMet, I worked there for 31 and a half years as a bus mechanic and then retired for almost 14 years. And when they did this, they had three, when I was working, they had three cleaners per garage. And that's all they did was clean the buses and the trains. Now there's only maybe one. You can't tell me that this is not a public safety hazard on your equipment out there. There are people getting stuck by needles and everything else because they're not being properly cleaned. I don't care what they have to say in management. This is a fact. Thank you. Comments. Hopefully, the staff who's been involved in the realignment of the service out there can may make sure we have have noted his concerns uh, in our in our decisions as we move forward and the actual the realign before the light rail line opens. So, okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, the next two, Chris Walker and Al Margulies. Hello, everybody. This is just my uh, general uh, Thanksgiving message just to let you know that I am <laughs> thankful for the service that you all provide, that uh, TriMet has been a blessing in my life all these years, as you know, and serving on CAT and getting around with the lift system and the bus system. I just, I am uh, always amazed, and I always tell people what a, blessing even though you know it was hard when I first discovered I couldn't drive because I, I like to get around well I can get around anywhere I need to with lift and bus basically so I just wanted to say thank you and little times have been hard it's always a pleasure to uh, know that you're working as hard as you can for our best and uh, helping out as great as you can thanks coming in and Thanks. Yeah, same to you. Good. Al, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I apologize in advance if any of you find my comments offensive, but the last time I checked, we lived in a country that still supported free speech. Oh. Okay, my name is Al Margulies, former TriMet employee and avid transit blogger. I have several things on my agenda. Firstly, unlike Mr. McFarlane and the TriMet Board of Directors, I actually keep my promise, promises, and I promise to pay Mr. McFarlane for losing my small claim against him when he paid me back for my health care that he stole and refused to pay back until now. So I have your $150, Neil. I know you don't need the money, but uh, as we all see how you are, grab what you can get, Neil. I also want to make a few comments about the board. First, I want to mention that I refer to this board as the sock puppets. During Mr. McFarland's tenure, TriMet reliability has gone down the tubes and customer satisfaction has been in steep decline. By all objective measures, Mr. McFarland has been a failure. How does this board react? By allowing Mr. McFarland to write his own ways. Not only that, but you made it retroactive. Only sock puppets allow that type of behavior. Now let's talk about the contract. The TriMet general manager and the TriMet board of directors lied to every single one of your retirees. You told us one thing and you gave us something different. That's called bait and switch. Let me define that for you. The action generally illegal of advertising goods with the intention of substituting inferior goods. 
This little change to the contractual obligations has caused a 25% reduction to my after-tax pension. And if I actually get sick, that would cut my pension by an additional 50%, leaving 25% for me to have as cash. But why would Mr. McFarland care about that? He'll walk away with an absurd pension. Furthermore, these contracts are not to be trusted anymore. We see, next time you can come back and take away more. And we've seen you've made the pattern here. The only people that come out year after year are the TriMet executives. The rest of us, the employees and the riders keep losing. TriMet really serves its executive class. All the needs of the public and the employees are second rate. It's the typical 1% profiting off the other 99%. You guys should be ashamed of yourselves. Thank you for allowing me to speak. All right, we have even more <coughs> and Madeline Moore. I see you both want to talk about Ordinance 332. I think I just indicated we were going to have a little discussion about that later. I want to make sure you understood that. Unfortunately, I'm uh, <clears throat> not going to be able to okay. stay for that discussion, so I'm going to have to have my piece now. Um, and Maddie is uh, stuck in traffic, but she's going to be able to be here for the rest of the meeting whenever she gets here, fortunately. Um, so uh, you know my name is Avon, and I'm a member of Bus Riders Unite, and um, as I think has become clear to everyone who's familiar with BRU, we do see transit justice as part of a civil rights struggle. Um, so does the FTA. Um, FTA regulations treat equal access to transportation as a civil right. Um, the Ordinance 332 um, analysis that TriMet sent to the FTA to try to figure out whether they uh, needed to um, need to consider any sort of disparate impacts, um, quoted the FTA guidance provided earlier this year, which I would like to quote again for the benefit of everyone in the room. Um, as a reminder, the FTA ruled that TriMet was compliant in June 2012 when it voted to set the transfer at a flat two hours without conducting an equity analysis of the impact on weekend riders. But that was only on a technicality because the regulations in place didn't specify that transfers were part of fair policy. In its letter to TriMet, FTA affirmed that changes to transfers merited an equity analysis according to the spirit, if not the letter, of civil rights law. And the letter stated, quote, a transfer policy directly affects a rider's ability to access a transit system. The transfer policy relates to the amount a rider will spend on a ride and may affect his or her choice in which fare or medium to purchase. Due to the nexus a transfer policy has with accessing a transit system, FTA views a change to a transfer policy the same as a change to any fare medium." Unquote. This is not something, I mean, it seems obvious to us, but it wasn't something that was obvious during the previous discussions of this ordinance to try that. So I think it's important to just kind of frame things by keeping that in mind that we are talking about um, a civil rights requirement and a civil rights issue when we talk about transfer policy times. So um, transfer policies are a civil rights issue, directly affects riders. Um, our own last three years of consistent engagement on this issue have shown that transfer policies do disproportionately affect low-income riders and people of color because they're more likely to rely on transfers. Uh, TriMet's own analysis sent to the FTA showed that there was um, uh, no harm to people of color or low-income riders and only benefit to uh, low-income riders specifically by extending the transfer time. Um, we um, have a bit of a problem with the way that low-income rider was defined for the purpose of that analysis. It doesn't really capture enough people because it was using 150% of the federal poverty line, which is, you know, it leaves out people who are low-income, um, such as those who rely on Section 8 um, help in housing. But um, clearly it's something that would help and not hurt regardless of how you do your analysis. Um, and the last thing I wanted to say, which may not come up during the civil rights discussion, was that uh, we do think that there are still concerns about TriMet data collection. That was something that the FTA letter highlighted, 
um, that TriMet's data on ridership is too limited. And looking forward, we see scope for improving our understanding of rider travel patterns rather than bus schedules. And that'll give us a better impact idea of the impact that service changes and fare changes have on different demographic groups. And it will allow TriMet to ensure its changes best ser serve the transit dependent. But again, based on the information that we have, that TriMet's collected, that we've collected, uh, we know that there's absolutely no doubt who's going to benefit from longer transfer times. And so when you do untable this this month and then vote on it um, in December, when you vote to extend the transfer, that's, you know, what you'll be voting for, equity for low-income riders and people of color. Thanks. So the next, next two, Sam Diaz and uh, Ron Salt, Salt, Salton, is it? Sworn, okay, I can't read your right, I'm sorry. Well, I guess we have one more too, so continue on. So, Mr. Diaz, good morning. For the record, I'm going to say I'm Diaz. I've been real busy. Thank you, thank you. I'm sorry, go ahead, please. Um, the Community Engagement Coordinator for 1000 Friends of Oregon. Uh, this morning I come here to advocate for a more comprehensive data collection on our region's ridership, as well as the extension of a fare. The Portland metro region has long been hailed for its ability to collaborate in the land use and transportation arena. Just one example is when Neil McFarlane expressed his support for Metro's climate smart communities, saying that he would be willing to be a lead voice in advancing a transit strategy. We greatly appreciate that leadership. Um, we need this type of leadership to be successful in linking our land use and transportation systems to, to provide energy and resource efficient development and operations. Next month, Metro will adopt the Climate Smart Communities strategy to meet the region's greenhouse gas reduction target, a state mandate, which TriMet and others throughout the region help develop. Perhaps the single most important element of that strategy is to achieve the level of transit operations in the adopted 2014 RTP. The necessary transit financial investments and supporting land use actions to implement the RTP that will be made by TriMet, Metro, and the region's cities and counties will have a powerful and long-lasting impact on every neighborhood in this region. Therefore, for a su successful climate smart strategy and transit system, it will be critical for TriMet, working with its partner local and regional governments, to address at least two things. The first is that lower income and transit dependent populations need frequent and efficient transit service to access employment, school, opportunities. These populations ride transit at a much greater rate than higher income populations and would increase that ridership with improved service. Therefore, to actually reduce greenhouse gas emissions and meet the needs of lower income residents, transit service to these communities must improve. Experience has shown the region that transit investment has the potential to bring both benefits and burdens to impacted areas. While it increases economic activity, it can also lead to involuntary displacement. While it increase, er, this result has been that lower income communities and communities of color have been pushed to the outer edges of the TriMet service area, where land use patterns are not as efficient as in the urban core, and where transit service is poor in many places, particularly east of northeast and southeast 122nd. And you can see that in the maps I attached for you all. This requires residents to make more transfers and wait longer times between buses to get around to their daily needs. Therefore, 1,000 Friends of Oregon supports the longer time period for fare tickets. In addition, we support TriMet collecting data on an ongoing basis of who rides transit, where to, and why, so the region can make informed decisions to ensure our transit system meets the triple bottom line of reducing the region's GHG emissions, producing accessibility to jobs and opportunity for low in lower income and other transit populations. Thank you for your time. Appreciate your comments. I live at 1543 Southeast Umatilla, for the record. Uh, I sent a letter about a week, or maybe about two weeks ago. It looks like this. It's two pages. Sent it as per the, uh, your uh, clerk's uh, instructions. And then I, uh, this morning I just handed out a map that shows uh, some options for crossing the Columbia River that were developed by the Southwest Washington Regional Transportation Council. Uh, I've been advocating an idea called option three west there that's 
crossing by the um, Burlington Northern. But uh, what I want to say, and I'll summarize the points that I have, have in my letter, is that uh, I've had some experience in transit issues. Uh, I mean, I've had a lot of other things to do with my life, but actually back in 1970, I uh, learned about the 1990 transportation plan. I volunteered for Tom Walsh campaign for mayor. Uh, and then I was glad the Mounted Freeway was stopped, but basically the, the larger plan was stopping the 1990 transportation plan. And I uh, support the things like the Gresham Max, uh, but everything has kind of a natural limit. So um, there's been a uh, resistance uh, in among some people to having a highway that would complete what is a basic elemental concept of transit planning, and that's what's called a ring road. Nearly every city has a ring road of some type around it so that traffic that's headed uh, not into the city can skirt it and, and avoid going to the downtown. We have a, that on the east side with I-205, and we have a portion of that on the west side with Highway 217, but we don't actually have something in the northwest district. Um, but <coughs> having said that, um, at a, um, a conference that uh, Metro Council Robert at Liberty put on about three years ago, he had a panel of Oregon leaders. One was a uh, retired uh, traffic modeler for Metro, Keith Lawton, and we presented 14 ideas. He, he said he did like this idea that I presented of completing the ring road um, via what's usually called the Western Arterial Highway. And by doing that, um, I think TriMet can regain some of the leadership in mass transit. And, and let me explain that. Um, yes, in the, in the 1970s, it was uh, good leadership to um, forego the 1990 transportation plan and build Max. But the world's moved on. There's a lot of other cities that have good systems. So uh, what we could do here is, is develop an uh, electrical system and it, uh, it could be hybrid electric. Uh, London is ex experimenting with all electric buses. And um, I could see how this third bridge, m the idea of the Western Arterial Highway, could have electrical generating capability in it in, in the form of an underwater turbine uh, that would, would help charge up buses and whatever combination they are. So that could also be a model for other cities that are on river power like Spokane, uh, Bend, wherever there's a current, you could have, you could generate enough power for electrical transit of a, a modest scale. So we could become a leader if we develop that idea, but it's critical to, to look at the Western Arterial Highway and how that can facilitate mass transit. And there's a number of ways that it can, as I pointed out in my letter. I'd like Bill, to go I'll on. I have to ask you to wrap, okay. wrap up. Yeah. Anyway, it, a, a shortcut, as it is, benefits all modes. It, it eliminates uh, transfer times, and bicyclists can, can bicycle short distances, whereas now it's about a 20-mile commute. So this Western Arterial Highway really benefits all modes. Good. Thank you, Ron. No. Not Bill. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. And I see now that uh, Madeline Moore has made it here, so uh, you're our last speaker this morning. Ms. Moore, oh, there she is. Good morning, members of the board. I'm glad that I finally did make it. Uh, my name is Madeline, and I'm also a member of BRU. And the last time I testified in front of the board, it was about a year ago, and it was about the way in which extending transfer times would aid job seekers like myself. And the two jobs that I've had since then have increased my sense of the importance of extending transfer times, both from my own experience of commuting and listening to my coworkers talk about their commutes. There are a lot of workers in Portland whose shifts fall outside normal commuting hours and some of them come from the farthest reaches of the Portland metropolitan area, like Gresham, near the edges of the TriMet map. And it can take almost two hours to get from Gresham to Tigard at the best of times, and when you're getting off work at 11 p.m. on a Sunday, it can take longer than that. 
The jobs with the most irregular hours are often the low paid service jobs, which means that those people are the most likely to rely on TriMet and not own a car. I'm happy that service is being restored to almost what its previous level was in 2004, but it's not that much help to people who don't live near those selected high frequency lines. Affordability matters as much as service, and I think that extending the length of transfer times would help to expand the travel options for low-income riders, and it would better suit the size of our city. Thank you. All right, that concludes our public forum. Um, with that, I think we can move right into our regular business agenda. So I'm going to call the uh, regular meeting of the uh, Tri-County Metropolitan Transportation District of Oregon Board of Directors meeting uh, for Wednesday, November 19th, 2014 to order. With that, we'll go right into our regular agenda. Uh, and uh, the first items up are our board reports. And we have a, hopefully a report on the Committee on Accessible Transportation from uh, Director Bethel. Good morning, board members. Good morning. Thank you. Um, the, committee, uh, bleh, bleh, bleh. the Committee on Accessible Transportation is not meeting this month. We've chosen to take, in fact, today. They're at uh, the um, Center Street um, facility, I'm touring that. And they also will be taking an opportunity to look at one of the newer buses that is going to be going onto the fleet to see how that's going to be. So hopefully we will, uh, again, we'll meet again in, in December and we'll give you a report at that time. If there are any questions? That's a shortage report. That is. That's a, that is. <laughs> Can I ask you to keep going then on the TriMet Accountability Committee? Yes, it's great to report that the uh, TAC um, is up. And it's, it's running um, since the launch. We have received uh, five separate reports that have come in to the hotline. Four of them are, have been anonymous. All of the incoming reports are classified either as a Tier 1 or a Tier 2, meaning that they allege fraud, waste, or abuse of TriMet resources, which is a Tier 1. And Tier 2 is that they relate to some other topic that does not relate to those three categories. Tier 1 reports are investigated by internal audit and classified as low, medium, or high urgency. Tier 2 reports are informed of other channels where they might pursue their complaints. Of the five reports that we received, two of them were classified as Tier 1, one with a low level of urgency and investigated by internal audit, and three were classified as a Tier 2 and redirected to the appropriate channels. Both of the Tier 1 reports were investigated and closed without any finding of fraud, waste, or abuse, and within about two weeks of being reported. Both reporters were given a brief summary of the findings of the investigation. We will continue to monitor the process as we continue to go, and uh, we will be bringing, bringing back a report to you in about another four months or so. Uh, take Excellent. any questions that anyone might have. Excellent. Sounds like the system's working as planned, and we're, we're getting the standard operating procedures uh, in order. Yes. Good. Good. Thank you. So, as I, excuse me, as I recall, this was part of the Secretary of State's audit recommendation, and um, does that office know that we're, this is up and going? Good question. I'm not sure we, we circled back with them recently. We do intend to do that, though, with a sort of a one-year wrap-up, and that was intended for your, your meeting in January, and we'll make sure we bring the Secretary of State's office into that wrap-up as well. Yeah, would you do that, please? Yeah. Good comments. Yes. Yes. Other comments, questions for Dr. Bethel? Okay. Seeing none, then, let's move to the Transportation Equity Advisory Committee, or as we call it, TIAC. Yeah, right. Director Saragoza. Actually, we're meeting tomorrow. Okay. And on the agenda is to talk about the um, transit equity analysis. So that'll be the major part of our discussion tomorrow. Okay. okay. Good. Quick report also. Uh, Director Prosser, do you want to give us an update on both the Metro Policy Advisory Committee and then maybe after that the Finance and Audit Committee meeting? Okay. The um, Metro Policy Advisory Committee has been... Um, working on two major projects. One is the urban growth report, um, which is due next year, and the climate smart communities report. With the uh, growth management report, um, we've looked at um, basically the basic assumptions that will be going into the report um, and have 
um, made a recommendation to the Metro Council that um, they adopt those assumptions. Um, Metro will proceed with uh, the development, final development of the report for adoption um, in 2015. I can't remember the time frame, but I think it'll probably be in the fall. Um, with Climate Smart Communities, we have been working on that for quite some time. Um, November 7th, we had a joint meeting between the um, Metro Policy Advisory Committee and the Joint Policy Advisory Committee on Transportation. Um, so lovely committee names all over the place. Um, we're very close to a final uh, report. Um, the preferred alternative uh, that um, both committees have focused in on would produce a, a reduction in the region's carbon footprint uh, by 2035 of about 29 percent, which is a little, little bit above the, the state required 20 percent. So it's, it's a good result. It does uh, rely heavily on expansion of transit service throughout the region. Um, various other uh, improvements to the transportation system. It does come with a very large price tag, um, which uh, will be the next challenge to pay attention to. Um, I think some of our discussion most recently, I think people are concerned that that high price tag would have to be all paid out of one source. And in point of, in point of fact, I think there are a number of sources that could be, be brought to bear. and so. Um, you know, I think that'll be our, uh, part of our discussion next month. So the I idea, though, is to, for um, Metro Policy Advisory Committee to finish up our work and make a recommendation to the uh, Metro Council next month. So very close to completion. If there are any questions about the, either of those two projects? I see no questions, but thank you again for your service on that. It is greatly appreciated. Mm -hmm. So. The Finance and Audit Committee, uh, we met just before this meeting. Um, we um, were taken through a, a review of, of uh, our financial performance for the first quarter and uh, kind of looked at some of the options as, as we're, uh, staff is working on the financial forecast. Um, you know, generally we're in, in good shape. Uh, revenues are very slightly below budget, 0.5%, um, so we're very close on that. You know, in forecasting, that's essentially right on. Um, and our expenditures to, to date are um, a little bit below budget. Um, so we're in, in good shape there. We did look at some of the um, reporting instruments, tables, and such, and had a discussion about um, presentation of some of those tables. We asked for some additional information. Um, where we're working on this is... Um, the Finance Committee in December uh, will have a discussion. Um, we'll have a preliminary look at the financial forecast for 2016. And again, that's a five-year forecast um, with the goal to have bringing that to this board for discussion and to provide direction to the staff in, for the development of next year's budget. And that will be in January. So you can count on having a, a more, more complete discussion at that time. We also uh, had a brief discussion about the honored citizen fair options. I uh, want to do some um, more public outreach on that and um, begin looking at transit equity analysis, um, f you know, four basic uh, alternatives on, on how to approach that. We talked about some of the pros and cons. We'll carry um, those alternatives forward as we talk with CAT and uh, TAC and, and some of the other committees. Uh, Get, get them involved and get uh, feedback from them. So uh, we did get uh, several uh, updates from the general manager, and I assume you'll be covering uh, the bulk of those here, so I won't go into those. So. Any questions about any of those? Good report. Any questions? It's more for the general manager, if I can wait. So. Okay. Okay. No, I went ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Never stopped you before, right? <laughs> You know, um, I, I wonder if other agencies in the country, this size or even bigger, do as much outreach, involvement, bending over backwards, it seems like, to do all the things that we do. <clears throat> and 
that we collect this kind of information and it, sometimes it's not perfect, but um, I don't know if you can, if you want to speak to that now, but it, you know, I've been around other cities and it seems everywhere you go, there's a TriMet stamp on something or, you know, it's, you hear things and this and that. So I just, maybe I, just for my own edification. We can certainly do, more board member Esmond, uh, uh, sort of a little more scientific review, but, it, but I would tell you that um, I think each transit district and their home communities have certain standards that are set by those communities. Um, and I would tell you that I think our community sets a very high standard for involvement and participation and outreach. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's good. I think we're a better system because of that. But I would tell you, I don't. I agree with you that I don't see that same standard in many other cities. Uh, I shared with you, I met with uh, a, a group of other transit, Western Transit uh, general managers or CEOs um, recently in San Diego, and very different community with a very different style of outreach associated with it. Um, and frankly, different responsibilities between the MPO, the Metro organization, and the transit provider. That's the other thing that influences that uh, in, in many communities. So I don't know that I've answered your question, but I would say that you know, generally the transit you answered my question. are aligning to the standards of our community. Again, our community standards related to that, I think are very high, appropriately so. Okay, thank you. It's a good answer, good answer. All right, well, nothing more in the board reports. I'm gonna turn it over to you, Mr. General Manager, to, to uh, go through your reports, and I think you're the up first. All right, Mr. Board President and members of the board, good morning. I'm uh, pleased to be here. Um, I did wanna just, comment on a couple of the uh, notes that came up to you during the public forum. One is that um, by really the end of this fiscal year, we're scheduled to have, again, more service in place, just slightly more service than, than we had during the recession. And we'll have our frequent service restored and actually growing the number of service hours above that. So I just wanted to be clear about that service level. And then we intend to bring to you um, our recommended final draft of the Orange Line service plan, which incorporates the new light rail service as well as the bus service. And I think what we've been able to do um, as our economy has rebounded is really focus more resources, frankly, uh, into that corridor. So essentially what we're doing is taking some of the bus service on the trunk line between Milwaukee and downtown, taking all those hours of bus service and redeploying it as feeder service in Clackamas County. And that's not just feeder service to light rail line, but it's also more uh, service within the North Clackamas County community, providing inter-community destinations as well. So we're taking a major step up in the level of bus service in North Clackamas County um, with, the, with the proposed plan. And we'll share all of the details uh, on that with you. Uh, next month, and again, that would be for your consideration and, and ultimate adoption as we move through the budget process next year. Um, and just related to the, the contract issues as related to the retirees, I would just, just reiterate, as you well know, that the contract was approved not just by you, but by an overwhelming proportion of the ATU active members. So that 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 is a an important, I think, notion, is you're not imposing a contract. This was negotiated and agreed to by the union itself and the members, our employees. So I, I would just um, just remind you for the record of, of that, um, of, of those important steps that were occurred. And again, as you noted, and as I certainly have made it very clear, we were thrilled to be a, in a position where we could actually offer that uh, that agreement um, that our employees could uh, either adopt or not, and they did adopt it. Um, and getting to that point was very, I think, very meaningful for us all. Um, any questions on any of that? I'll jump into uh, a ridership update, which is generally positive. Uh, for the month of October, our ridership overall was about 3% up. Um, over the system provided about 9.1 million trips uh, in October. Um, one of the interesting things is to sort of look at the bus service. Uh, you have um, approved a number of investments in improving bus service. And um, in October 2013, bus ridership overall is up about 5.5% on both uh, weekdays and weekends. Um, and if you look um, on the sort of just frequent service level, that was up actually up about 5.8%. 
So October is usually a strong month, but it's really nice to see that ridership on the bus re respond to the number of uh, hours of bus service that you've added in the budget over the next last few years. And just to sort of look at that, um, we have added about 5.9% more vehicle hours, um, and ha or maybe I put it this way, we have 5.9% more bus vehicle hours in October 2014 than we had in October 2013, a year ago. And we see roughly equivalent um, growth in ridership. And again, recall that as one adds service, it usually takes a while for people to really begin to take um, uh, advantage of that old sir and, and of that service and really understand its availability and, and added convenience. So uh, we're we're very pleased with those overall ridership reports. Uh, Max was is essentially down about one percent on weekdays. We did see a dip also in, in West, ri West ridership. We did have some service interruptions uh, in the month of October that I think uh, affected that, but three, up about 3% overall, which is very good performance for the system. Uh, I also wanted to just draw your attention to these, uh, this little package that you have in front of you. Um, I'm, I couldn't be more pleased with the partnerships and the growth of our Be Seen, Be Safe campaign over the last year. And I really wanted to point out that because our marketing department has done a superb job of growing this program. As you know, we are squarely in the midst of what sometimes we call the dark times, when it's dark in the morning and dark in the evening, and so commuting becomes a bit more dangerous uh, for, for cyclists and pedestrians. And even, frankly, um, uh, drivers in terms of that. And so with the change to daylight savings times, um, we, uh, um, we did uh, initiate another large campaign. We had a lot of partners uh, associated with this. 25 different partner organizations helped us outreach to our, our riders on, at our transit systems, actually on some bus lines at max stops handing out these sorts of, this sorts of, uh, of, of gizmos and, um, and, and information and just reminding people it's important to make sure you are seen as a pedestrian or a cyclist. Um, and recall our philosophy about pedestrians is that every transit rider is a pedestrian first and last uh, in terms of their trip cycle. So it's very important for us in terms of general um, um, safety. Um, you may have seen KGW's Drew Carey did a live segment from the Viva Transit uh, Center on, on this whole uh, effort, sort of making it a little bit fun. Um, but I'd also just note that this campaign has grown. Um, the number of street teams uh, this year increased by 40%, uh, and the number of volunteers increased by 66%. And we get volunteers from all of our partner agencies around the, the, uh, the Regency of Gresham, Washington County, City of Beaverton, many other uh, jurisdictions participate in this with us now. Um, and it actually grew to become a statewide campaign, and ODOT incorporated into their drive, um, drive, drive Less, Save More campaign. I always sort of make sure I don't get those reversed. Drive Less, <laughs> Save More campaign uh, statewide. So I wanted to particularly thank um, our ODOT for providing us 20,000 of these little uh, blinking lights and to KGW for being our media sponsor on the event. They continue to run spots on this, which I think are very effective. Um, and again, thank you to our marketing staff for their work in putting all of this together. That's an important annual event on our part. I wanted also to give you just a quick preview to uh, board action we'll be bringing for your consideration next month. And it has to do with the Powell Division Bus Rapid Transit Corridor. Uh, and it will be a contract for engineering services to begin to develop that further as we go through the planning steps with the uh, local community group groups. Um, I would note that we have a steering committee that actually incorporates the jurisdictions uh, that are participating as well as a number of the organizations like Catholic Charities and the Neighborhood Associations and PCC uh, uh, at 82nd. Mount Hood Community College, others are all participating in that steering committee. And then over the last uh, couple of months, they confirmed the preferred alignment, which is essentially Powell connecting to a division. That connection would occur somewhere between 50th and 82nd. Um, and they com uh, uh, confirmed the preferred mode, which is bus rapid transit through that area. 
So that allows us to really move uh, much more rapidly to begin to develop the alternatives and the physical improvements, uh, the, s the concepts for the physical improvements and service that would be a a associated with that project. Um, and so we're really pleased with that progress uh, and we'll be uh, again coming to you with, uh, with a recommendation for some consultant assistance to help us uh, begin to flesh that out. Our hope is that we're actually in what FTA would call small starch project development by the middle of 2015. Uh, and this would be in preparation for developing the materials that would be necessary to apply for a small starch grant, which is a typical process for um, developing bus rapid transit projects around the country. Um, so a lot of decisions, obviously, and a lot of detailing ahead of us, and we'll bring to you a contract that is really intended to provide the resources necessary to, to get us to those decisions. Um, Mr. President, that concludes my remarks. We do have some presentations and remarks by other staff, but I'd be happy to take any questions at this point. Questions? Uh, no, Neil, just a statement. Um, up on where my office is, it's, there's a lot of work going on, warehouses, light, light industrial. So yes. uh, hopefully we're looking at that out in the Gresham area. East County? Absolutely, and it's a very critical part of what we can now call our uh, east side, if you will, service enhancement planning efforts underway. Uh, we've seen some incredibly useful um, information recently developed by the Columbia Corridor Association that really demonstrates where the employees in that corridor live. Um, and so we now know that there needs to be strong links to the area that you're talking about. Um, and uh, the general East Portland area, because that's to a large extent where much of the employment base for many of those uh, those businesses are. So that's that's very integral to the whole service enhancement planning effort in that area. And that's hopefully we'll make sure we have enough of the bus shelters because uh, the wind kind of kicks up once in a while out there. So. <laughs> I've noticed. Okay. Yeah. I've worked out there one time in, on the freeway in the winter time. It was pretty cold. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. indeed. Other, other questions of Neil? I guess I would just ask that when you, when you or, or let me know if we're going to do this, uh, when we have the discussion of the bus rapid transit Powell division, uh, could you go over the funding package, the, the yeah. desires for capital and kind of the operating, what you're thinking we're going to, is everybody's talking about it, at least at this time? Uh, absolutely, we can we can certainly do that in a briefing session at some point. And but again, the the technical work is really going to drive that yeah. price tag and the funding requirements associated with it. So I'm just looking at the general kind yeah. of plan for yeah. how we're going to yeah. how it thinks it's going to be funded from the feds to the local side. Right. Okay, very good. Good. Happy to do that. Well, let's move on then to the next portions of your update. Right. So uh, I understand. Um, we have Harry Supporta here and Lieutenant Schopert. And we're going to do a sort of mid-year review of our uh, security and, and um, issues and our crime reports. So, so Harry, Lieutenant. Good morning, President Warner and board members. And... Uh, Commander Modica could not be here with us this morning, so um, Eric Schober is with us. Um, what I'd like to do is provide you what I call a mid-year report. So back in March, we provided the end of the year report. Unfortunately, there's a bit of a lag, so that's why uh, um, it's not at the half year marks exactly. But um, if I can do this. Right side. Okay. So uh, I'm pleased to report that essentially the um, the crime rate has uh, held pretty steady, and that's despite an increase in bus and rail service. Um, and you'll see these are for the. Uh, uh, I'm comparing the first six months of 2013 to 2014, and essentially the rates are uh, exactly the same, and. Um, and this is despite, for the first half of 2014, there is a 5% increase in the crime rate in the city of Portland. And so, um, as I've said in the past, what does happen is that 
<clears throat> the types of uh, criminal activity that we do see on the rail system fairly, it, it mirrors that of the city in general and the jurisdictions that we go through. So um, in your packet, you do have uh, these slides as well. And I don't want to go into great detail into this, the statistics themselves. But um, essentially, um, what we're seeing is that uh, for the first six months of uh, 2014 in the rail system, um, it pretty much uh, mirrors the overall rate of the entire calendar year of 2013. So we're on track. And in another slide, we'll show that there's beginning to see a sharp decrease as well. And the same holds true for, um, for the bus system, although we see just a slight uptick. But for me, it's, um, it's not alarming in that um, the rate is not that sharp of an increase. It's just fairly minor. So when we look at the first year of 2014, we can see that we have somewhat of an uptick in the first half of the, uh, the beginning of the year. Um, this is uh, uh, what occurs seasonally from year to year, and then we begin to see a sharp uh, decrease uh, beyond that. And this is a overall um, uh, picture of, of the types of crimes that we're seeing in the city of Portland, and I don't have statistics for the other jurisdictions, but just for the city. And what we see are increases in um, uh, auto theft and uh, larceny. And so that's, that's the, uh, uh, what we're experiencing as well in, uh, in our system. So I want to go back just for a moment uh, to this one. So we, we are seeing a shift in where criminal activity is occurring. And so if you notice on the graph, or the uh, table rather, that you'll see that in, um, in Gresham that there was an uptick in the type of uh, um, in, in reported crimes. And so the next question is, what types of crimes are we really seeing? And they're really, in that particular area, what we're seeing is uh, break-ins to autos, and we're also seeing auto theft. Uh, there's also an increase in the city of Hillsborough. Again, it begs the question, what types of activity are we seeing there? It's principally break-ins to autos. Um, there's a little bit of an increase in some areas with, uh, with thefts in general from persons, but that's... Um, a campaign that I'll explain in a minute as well, where we're still trying to educate the public as to how to protect their belongings, whether it's in their automobiles or whether it's um, they're holding it in their hands and they're carrying it on their person. So, so then what are the strategies? You know, what are we doing to do this, uh, to uh, try and control uh, criminal behavior? And one is obviously is presence on the system and we continue to um, forge uh, partnerships with our jurisdictions, uh, maintaining that presence. Obviously, the Transit Police Division plays a very large role in that, just as our contracted security service, G4S. Um, but we also have opportunities through TSA, which is a grant program, and a new program that we are launching uh, in December is uh, called street level outreach, and I'll explain that as well. Then obviously public education plays a very large role, um, encouraging our customers to pay attention to their belongings and uh, not to um, uh, keep things uh, in plain view when they park their automobiles, um, that those valuables need to be placed in a trunk or not just placed in the automobile in general. Uh, we're also going to be launching something called a security app, and I'll explain that in a minute. And also, we're trying to revitalize our current program that we have on respectful behavior um, and uh, trying to encourage uh, uh, a change in that area as well. And then, obviously, uh, physical security measures play a role as in, in, this, uh, in the overall strategy. So um, I know that you were recently informed that 
the TSA had uh, provided us with uh, three grants. Um, the first is to increase missions. This is to pay for overtime, and it's a two-year grant. Um, that helps us to increase patrols during the holiday season, such as the one coming up, and then any special events that uh, occurred during the year, such as Rose Festival um, and the Portland Marathon and others. And then we also have um, anti-terrorism teams, and we have, uh, and this helps to pay for additional police officers as well as a canine. Um, and uh, we were fortunate enough to receive a grant that helps pay for that program. So the whole aim of that unit and the officers is really to provide visible and unpredictable patrols. Uh, although we do use plainclothes uh, officers in, as part of this team as well. <clears throat> we also uh, requested funding to develop something called a uh, mobile phone security app. And what this is is a tool that allows a customer to report a, a behavior or um, an activity that is, is happening that, feels, that makes them feel uncomfortable. It's part of our See Something, Say Something campaign, uh, campaign. And unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, but there are times when customers just don't feel comfortable reporting uh, by picking up their phone. So this allows them to do it in such a way that it doesn't draw a lot of attention to themselves. So we're hoping to put this program together uh, by the uh, fall of next year. Uh, I'm encouraged, I'm, I'm hearing that maybe it may be even uh, sooner than that, but it allows this two-way conversation. The calls will be monitored real time, and when I say call, they're usually just text messages or, um, or, sent, or emails that are sent, and uh, they'll be monitored real time by a call center, and then um, they'll be fed to our transit police as appropriate. Uh, I also want to emphasize this is not to take the place of a 911 call. It is not a 911 call center. You know, so if there's something that needs immediate attention, our customers need to report that uh, as a, appropriately. And then we have another program that we're launching. Uh, this, was, uh, this is through the uh, Youth Violence Prevention uh, Office in the Mayor's Office. And um, it's also patterned after a Department of Justice program that has been underway since the mid-90s, and a number of cities have adopted this outreach program. And it's really trying to connect the outreach uh, workers with the youth and community in our community and to offer any services that um, they may need. Um, and it's all aimed at resolving any conflicts that might occur. And unfortunately, what happens at times is that those conflicts result in uh, a fight on board or, or altercation on board the, uh, our uh, uh, vehicles or at our transit center. So these workers are engaged with youth to try and diffuse those types of uh, circumstances. And then uh, lastly, we're also trying to revitalize our um, respectful behavior program. Uh, a number of new programs have been launched by MARTA in the Atlanta area. SEPTA, which is Philadelphia, and then DART, which is the Dallas area. And um, the theme that we want to promote that this is our transit system, it's your TriMet. And maybe that's not the, quite the slogan we're going to be using, but uh, that's at least a start. And that the aim of this program is really focused principally on school-aged uh, uh, kids as well as young adults. At the beginning of the year, we started to visit schools and went to school assemblies and met with other students. And in fact, earlier in the year, as through our internship program, uh, we had some of our uh, school-aged interns actually work in helping us develop a start of this type of program so that we better understand what resonates with, with the youth. Um, I don't want to be presumptuous to think that I know it's peer-to-peer -peer talking. That's what's important. So. Um, we're, we will be working on this uh, uh, through the year and hopefully we'll have something by uh, spring of next year that we'll fully launch. So uh, what I want to emphasize in closing is that crime in, does remain very low in the transit system. 
Um, there has been a 5% increase in the city, but yet we're, we're flat. Um, we, begin, we are continuing to look at the data. And as I said earlier, we're seeing these upticks in these other geographical areas where we were focusing previously. Uh, we're not in these particular areas. And now we are beginning to redeploy those resources. Uh, presence is always important, and we continue to um, provide as much presence as possible, and the TSA is uh, assisting in that area by providing us grants. Public education plays a role, and then lastly, fiscal security. So I don't know if you have any questions for myself or uh, Eric Schober. Five percent higher in the city, but on TriMet, it's I guess even we're staying at the same. Yes. Okay. Um, and where I I know that, but when something happens, I mean the media is is all over it. So then the perception I would assume to the community is that there's a very there's a lot of crime happening on our system. So how do we um, work with that? Well, that's always a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, I, not to put you on the, <laughs> on the spot at all, but I mean, that's what you hear. Yes. Right? Yes. And so then people start talking about who ride it, they're more concerned about their safety. Yes. So that's <coughs> why we place a lot of emphasis on presence on the system, uh, making our officers um, visible. And um, I don't know if Lieutenant Schober has anything to add about about that. Yes. I'm putting him on the spot now. <laughs> There's a couple of things that we like to do. One is we like to head on uh, face off with the, with the media because a lot of times we'll have a lot of negative uh, uh, portrayals of what's happening on the, on the transit system. The other thing we like to do is to try to educate the public through the media and educate the, the media themselves of the things we're doing and the accuracy of what really is happening on the system. Uh, we always relate to ourselves as a moving sidewalk. Um, so. Basically, what you have on the transit system is what you see on the public streets. And when you relate the fact that we're moving up to 300,000 people a day and the percentage is so low of the crime that we're having on the system, it's markedly different than what you would see in other cities. Uh, we're actually, for an open system, we're one of the most safest systems in the nation. It's actually kind of surprising that we don't have more problems but I think it's a, uh, I equate that to a couple of things. Probably the biggest thing is working together as a team. Uh, we work really closely with the transit supervisors, the bus operators, the train operators in education, planning, uh, communicating back and forth where the issues are and, and being flexible in our patrols. Like for instance, uh, Harry was talking about an uptick in, in uh, Larson's vehicles and auto thefts, that's something that will adjust our patrols and address that issue as we face it. Do we find where the park and rides are for our system, is there a lot break-ins in that? I mean, I, I, I mean, if you don't have it, that's fine, but it's just curious if there's a place where folks are parking their cars to ride our system, then how are we making sure that that's secure? There's a couple of things we're doing. Uh, there's uh, through surveillance, either plain clothes or in uniform, the patrols through the air with through security and for uh, police officers for going through the area. The other thing that, that uh, Mr. Supporter was talking about is education is a big thing because a lot of the theft from vehicles is targets of opportunity. Uh, people leave things, maybe not to them, maybe not considered valuable, but uh, if a thief sees something on a seat in plain view, he'll make the assumption that there might be something else in the car that could be of uh, further value. And then a lot of uh, the thefts out of the vehicles are minor, but it causes a lot more damage to the vehicle than the actual theft itself. And so the importance of just not leaving things of any, you know, like electronic nature uh, in plain view in the cars, that's a, one of the big things we can do. So to, to put things into a little bit of perspective, so when I said that there was an uptick in the, in the Gresham area, and it happened to be at the Cleveland Park and Ride. So we went from one to nine. So the numbers are really very small. So I, I, again, I want to put things in a little bit of perspective. We're not talking you know, hundreds, we're not talking 
the tens, but we're talking one to nine. So in other areas, you know, it may have been three, and now we have seven. And that's what I mean by perception, right? Yes. Is that uh, the general public's going to say, oh my gosh, you know, it's not safe. So thank you for that clarification. Any other questions? Hey, um, this app that you're talking about. Yes. Is that a off the shelf or is that something we'd, or we'll be developing? Actually, there's, there are off-the-shelf units, and then, uh, for example, LA decided to um, develop their own. So we'll be looking at both. Uh, we'll, we will be looking at what is available off-the-shelf, and is this everything we want it to be, or do we want it to do something a little bit different? And if it's that something different, then we'll have to look at maybe developing our own app. Um, Interestingly, when we begin to look at those units that are off the shelf as opposed to developing your own app, because I've been in contact with other transit agencies that have done this, the cost is just about the same. It, it, it doesn't really change. I don't understand that personally, but, <laughs> it, but it's the same. Okay, thank you. So Thank you for the report. Uh, this is always great information to keep us surprised at what's going on from a crime perspective and safety. And, you know, as I look at the transit crimes by mode, all modes, that really begins to give us a really good breakdown of what's going on uh, with, uh, with the crime uh, issue and challenge. You know, this, and we don't have 2013 to compare it to, but the crimes against customers, you know, persons, I mean, we, we were at 40 up to 50 in February, and then this significant decline down to roughly half of where it was at the beginning of the year. It, and you touched on some things that we're doing differently, but this is pretty significant. And again, without the comparison to previous years, we can't really look at it and say, okay, wow, this is, you know, we really ticked up in the first part of the year, and then we went back down to kind of where we were historically any any comments and related to whether or not that's the case or we really do we really are seeing a significant reduction in crimes against persons based on all the work that we're doing so part, part of it is uh, you have to understand also that in that category are thefts mm -hmm. and so what we really try and we we've, um, we've um, put a lot of emphasis in educating the public on how to protect their belongings and we did that at the start of the, this, uh, this year. And I think that is paying dividends, that people are beginning to understand that if I have this cell phone, I'm not gonna ha wave it in front of people. I don't know how many of you will take $400 out of your pocket. I don't even have 400 in my pocket, but, <laughs> but put, literally put it in your hand and hold it out for people to take. I mean, cell phone costs $400. That's the real value of it, you know, four or five hundred dollars, and people don't always understand that. So we're trying to educate the public that uh, there are ways to protect the, themselves. Um, the same thing with bicycle thefts. Um, it's surprising to me how many people. It's a, I guess, a testament to how comfortable a ride is because you see people nodding off. You know, they hang their bike and they go to sit down, and now they're asleep and they're not paying attention to the bike any longer. Anyway, I don't know if you want to add something to that. And that's kind of the thing we've done with education with other community groups and through the media is discussing those kind of things. Uh, we try to really watch the data and see where the situations are. If we start seeing an uptake in certain areas and theft of um, electronics and theft of bicycles were two things that we saw to start to spike up. And so we kind of shifted our patrol uh, to address those things both uh, in, in, uh, in plain clothes and in uniform and through education. And I think that's where we saw a lot of uh, a, a quick market drop in that, in that area. Just a, a couple of quick follow-up questions in regards to the, thank you for those responses. And when I think, Harry, you referenced, you know, we've got to remember that the crimes against persons, <clears throat> you know, that includes thefts. And if I remember correctly, historically, you've said the majority of crimes against persons are thefts. Is that is that a correct statement, or, is, or am I off? A there? Absolutely correct. So assaults are relatively few. 
which is, you know, it's still a, a phenomenal thing to wrap our minds around. Again, it was referenced by the lieutenant that we, we, we roughly move 300,000 people a day. Uh, and, you know, the situation that we're looking at here is a very, very low crime rate. Uh, is there, and you, and, and you also stated that crime across the city is up 5% in the city of Portland. And uh, we did, it, it does look like we did see some significant increases in some of the areas. East side went up 21%, if I'm reading that right. Yes. And uh, downtown went up 15%. So there's some significant increases. But like you said, it went up from a relatively small number. Yes. And so that increase, when you look at the percentage, it seems, wow, that's pretty big. But when you look at the actual underlying raw number. Uh, so you uh, look at West, there was a 200% increase. Yeah. You know, two. Makes you not want to live two. in. Makes you not want to live in Wilsonville. I mean, wow. I mean, Gresham's way better at fifteen percent. I mean, wow. I mean, it's, uh, come on out, folks. It's a great place to live. Balmy, Gresham, Oregon. So you know, it's just you know, as as I look at those numbers, it it um, does look like there's there, there's some increase, but not near you know from a whole number that you're seeing in the city. Which brings me to my final question, and President Warner, if you'll uh, indulge me, I will. final question. <laughs> On this issue, just to clarify, <laughs> as we look at, uh, you know, uh, you know, I'm, uh, because this is such a hot button, button issue as I go out to community groups and things like that, you know, we hear about this and it's great to have this data to be able to present to those folks and really get down to the gist of what their concerns are. And as we look at the crimes against vehicles, it's, you know, I'm just fascinated if we've done any work to quantify what goes on in very adjacent parking lots and structures and things like that. Uh, because what, what goes on against crimes against a person at TriMet, that's, you know, that's literally our issue to deal with. When I look at the crimes against vehicles component of this, and that's one of the biggest upticks we've seen, I'm a little bit challenged to claim that to be ours in, in just a blanket comment or statement. Yeah, there's education that we need to be doing uh, to, in, to encourage them not to leave things out because it is a crime of opportunity. But the flip side of that is if they were parked in our parking lot or our parking rides or if they were parked across, you know, the road, you know, or the literally the driveway at Clackamas Town Center, you know, if they left, the, if they left their phone or laptop on their seat, they would get stolen in both places. So... I mean, have we done any work to kind of quantify that to say what, you know, how we, you know, how we exist relative to those things that are close to us? Um, I have to say we haven't done a lot of work in that area. But the butt of that is that we do know that when we see an uptick in the gateway transit area with auto thefts and break-ins, mm -hmm. there is a similar uptick in across the street at the Fred Meyer parking lot. Correct. So that one I do know. Uh, the other ones, I, we, I haven't, I honestly haven't paid a whole lot of attention to doing that, but you're absolutely correct in that um, when you begin to see an, an increase in one particular area, you're going to see it in the adjacent area. And that's what I was saying in the beginning, that our numbers really are reflective of the community through which we go. Mm -hmm. So when you begin to see auto theft in one, in our system, that probably means you see auto theft in the geographical area that surrounds it as well. Which then encourages us to work with local uh, police departments and uh, local law, law enforcement in the general concept to ensure that, you know, we're assisting them in whatever we find in our situation and investigations, and they're assisting us in the same way. Because ultimately that crimes against vehicles is going to be something that doesn't stop at a parking lot line or whatever that is. And there needs to be this mutual work that's done there. Again, the crimes against person solely are issues, uh, if, you know, when they're happening in our system. And we're, it looks like we're doing really great work to address that. So I want to thank you guys for, for you know, the responses and the input. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you. I guess I'd like okay. to thank you all, too. I, my writing the transit system, it's clear that we have an increased presence uh, of enforcement, fair enforcement, and, and the transit police. It's very, very good to see, and, and I know it's appreciated by the riders that I, that I talk with. So and thank you. I think you. I failed to mention our, our supervisors, you know, our field supervisors. They're out there, too, and they're providing that presence. Yep. yep. Board President, as uh, Harry and Eric leave I, I just wanted to note I had the great honor of presenting a sort of a thank you if you will to the combined forces of the T transit police division at their annual all hands meeting here over the last month I've never felt safer in my life <laughs> but uh, truly we're really uh, 
we're very, I think, lucky, and um, we should be very proud of our Trans Police Division. Right. This combined unit from so many places, so many units around the, uh, the the region, contributing to that overall, and they have done a, just a phenomenal job. As you, as you know, crime was down 25% in 2013, and we've held it there. So that's because of uh, very deep attentiveness on their part to the system, and uh, really. Uh, Again, just want to thank, uh, issue my thanks to the TPD and the, the members of the force for doing really a terrific job for us on a regular basis. Thank you. Continuing on? Moving on, we do have a report in your packet on performance uh, uh, over the last quarter. Uh, again, we're into that quarterly reporting period, and I've asked Bob Nelson, our deputy general manager, so, Bob, we're getting a little behind schedule, so I'm wondering if we can kind of uh, well, scare a little bit. Up. I'll try and get through it, Neil. It is a very articulate report. <laughs> I'm sure I don't that. know if I can uh, condense it that much. Uh, but thank you, Neil. Mr. President, board members, good morning. Um, this is our third quarter report, which is July, August, and September of calendar year 14. Again, it moves under the uh, uh, focus areas of vehicle and system reliability, service delivery, and operator support. Uh, you have a packet in front of you. I'm going to only focus on the two-page uh, narrative summary, and there are associated graphs and tables attached to it for your, for your reference. Uh, under vehicle and system reliability, we look at uh, preventive maintenance, uh, miles traveled between mechanical failures, and maintenance attendance. So in this quarter, the third quarter, all of our uh, ma preventive maintenance exceeded our objectives. Uh, special note that our main maintenance of way uh, over the third quarter of last year I had a 30% improvement in preventive maintenance, which is uh, evidenced in the improving reliability of our right-of-way systems. Um, it's interesting to note uh, on uh, uh, maintenance that our system uh, has a rather extensive uh, span of, of service and frequency of service. For example, uh, Salt Lake City has approximately the same number of vehicles we have, both rail and bus. Uh, our ridership is exactly twice theirs. So we have intense service throughout the day, unlike uh, and into the evenings, and intense weekend service, which means our vehicles are in service longer so that the intervals between preventive maintenance inspections accelerates. So it puts a lot of uh, work on our maintenance divisions and they're, they're holding up to it right now. <clears throat> uh, under uh, miles traveled between uh, service-related repairs, note that uh, uh, light rail improved 8.2% over the third quarter of last year. We had a dip of 10% on the bus system uh, primarily due to some uh, continuing fleet defect in uh, some of our newer vehicles where the rear door, uh, which has these uh, grab handles that you push out to exit, uh, has been staying in the open position intermittently. Uh, but that requires us, because of obvious safety issues, to remove it from service. Uh, the vendor's working pretty hard on that, and I think we're, we're getting it. I just noticed the October results, uh, which will be a report in the next quarter, where our, our miles increased to almost 13,000 miles. So we're starting to come around a little bit. Now, order of magnitude on the bus system, it, it varies, but let's say 40,000 miles a day we're traveling. So if we could have 10,000 miles between uh, uh, road calls that affect service as before. So just to give you an order of magnitude, uh, our system is pretty reliable, and even at 10, and we're, and we're at 13 now for October, that's, that's very high in our industry in the country. Uh, maintenance attendance, uh, st holding steady uh, in the 94 to 95% range, uh, and that's, that's important for us in maintenance because unlike the transportation side where we do staff extra drivers, uh, to account for absent drivers because we need somebody in the seat, in that rail seat or the bus seat. Uh, we don't do that for maintenance, so when they don't show up, we're hurting. Uh, so when they stay steady at 94, 95 percent, that's good. Uh, service delivery, uh, there we look at, of uh, course, on-time performance, our transportation attendance, and then uh, the productivity of our, of our service in terms of boarding rides per hour. Uh, Fixed route on time performance this, uh, this third quarter versus last was uh, uh, up uh, by 3.2%. Max and West were slightly down. Uh, recall that in August, which fell in this third quarter, we had a weak closure of the, of the rail system at, at Lloyd, the Lloyd platform, and that significantly disrupted rail service, which contributed significantly to their decline 
of 2.9%. Uh, when we normalized that, the on-time performance was much better. Uh, transportation attendance improved by 7 tenths of a percent over the prior quarter. Uh, and bus max boarding rides per hour increased from the last year's third quarter, uh, with bus posting a 4.7 percent gain, which t continues to uh, indicate to us that the service we're adding is productive, as was mentioned uh, a while ago. Uh, West was slightly down, but less than one, uh, only 0.9 percent, uh, actually 1.2 uh, boarding rides uh, less, so essentially flat. Um, on uh, operator support, we're looking at uh, our, our refresher training, we call them recertification training for uh, bus and rail operators as well as our uh, field supervisors. We look at co the collision rate and we look at uh, complaints. Uh, the certification program just began in earnest in October, which will fall, of course, into the next quarter. We had concluded the prior year's recertification in June, uh, but already in October, uh, the bus and rail uh, training is off to a very good start. We've got 282 bus operators refreshed and recertified and 67 rail operators in October. So the target to complete that in the fiscal year is well in hand. Uh, collisions were up a bit uh, this qu third quarter versus last. Um, in both bus and rail, a uh, part of this is in the rail system out of 177 rail operators we have right now, 47 were hired in this uh, calendar year. Uh, on the bus side, uh, 282 operators hired in this year. Uh, so that's each roughly about almost a quarter of the workforce is that new. Now, operators are trained and they're trained very well. Uh, operating a bus or a rail car is dis not with, despite training an acquired skill and it's acquired in service so as they uh, as time goes by they're going to get a little bit more comfortable in moving along and and uh, better uh, feel for the vehicle so we're going to see uh, that collision start to level off as as more uh, time goes by and newer operators become accustomed uh, complaints uh, for uh, bus operators decrease which that's a good thing and a slight increase in, uh, for MAX. And again, many of those complaints were associated to the uh, weak closure of the system at Lloyd. Uh, so when we normalize for that, it starts to level out as well. Uh, with that, I can take uh, questions or comments. Okay. Um, on the um, collisions. Yes. Um, you know, you say collision and, and I immediately have this picture of two cars coming together full speed. But I'm assuming collision can also be, you mentioned most of it was with fixed objects, so that's bumping a, a signpost or with, minim, I assume, minimal damage? Exactly. Uh, very few of these fixed object uh, accidents, and they are similar to what you just said, uh, are of a serious nature. Certainly with the new operators, because they tend to move a little bit more slowly because they're very cautious, uh, their low speed incidents. Mm -hmm. We are seeing a bit of an uptick in collisions uh, by operators in the five to 10 year category who maybe are becoming too comfortable. And some of those accidents, because they're moving more quickly, uh, can be of a more serious nature. But serious collisions don't happen very often. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thank right. you very thank much. Thank you very much. Uh, good report. I like to hear with the trend. A lot. Mr. General Manager, I think the next one's uh, one we've been waiting for. So. Right. So, Mr. President, members of the board, I'd like to call uh, John Abel and, and Jake War up to the dais. And what they wanted to do was to give you a presentation of the Title VI Fair Equity Analysis for Ordinance 332 related to transfer policy changes. And as you well know, this was tabled at your, I believe, January meeting. Um, and we have had the opportunity to send uh, a draft analysis that they will be presenting to you to the uh, local FTA Civil Rights Office, and they did indicate, as I think John L. and Jake will note to you, that um, the, the analysis passed muster with them. Um, and what we wanted to do was then uh, use this as an opportunity then also to talk to you about uh, the uh, next steps related to the consideration of this ordinance. So. Um, Jake and John L. Great. Well, good morning, uh, board. Uh, President Warner, members of the board, again, for the record, my name is John L. Bell, Director of Diversity and Transit Equity. 
here at TriMet, and with me is Jake War, our policy advisor for uh, the department. This morning, as the general manager uh, pointed out, and I know that uh, you are all very excited to uh, uh, hear the report, uh, we'll kind of give you sort of an overview of the analysis conducted on Resolution 332 and uh, next steps associated with uh, its progression. Uh, you'll recall this chart here, which essentially points out when TriMet is required to conduct a Title VI analysis. There are really two uh, categories, one of which is a fair change, the other is a major service change. Uh, today, we'll hone in on the fair change. Uh, as you'll recall, FTA uh, gave us new guidance, which essentially stated that any change in fare, uh, any change in transfer time is equated to uh, a fair change. So again, that's what triggered our equity analysis today is a fair change, which is now uh, equivalent to any change in transfer time, in case you were wondering about that. So with that, I'm going to point it, uh, hand it off to Jake. He's going to go through uh, the analysis that he conducted again. Uh, based upon the analysis we currently have, uh, we did uh, pose a question to FTA as to uh, the viability of the data that uh, we currently have, and uh, uh, there was no response on that question, uh, but uh, they were uh, pleased with uh, the actual analysis, and we'll talk more about that. So with that, Jake. Thanks. Good morning members of the board. Um, so I'll kind of run you through the methodology that we used given the, the data that we have, which we used the TriMet FAIR survey conducted in fall of 2012. Um, and the primary question is uh, that we looked at was this one, um, which asked riders if they had to transfer to or from a different line to make this trip in one direction. Their options were no or yes, and if yes, how many times they needed to transfer. So. In doing an equity analysis, we essentially look at the answers to that question by the groups who answered it. And so we compare minority and non-minority groups, um, minority defined as uh, everybody except for white, non-Hispanic, um, and low income and higher income, low income being defined as 150% um, federal poverty level or below. Um, and again, this this, we looked at the riders who paid a single fare, um, either cash or ticket, since they're the only ones to whom transfer time really applies. Everyone else doesn't have to worry about the transfer time. Um, so in looking at this analysis and approaching this analysis, we said, well, ideally what we would know is we would know how long people's trips are and when they transferred, if they transferred. So essentially we would know person A took a trip from Gresham to Tigard, as, as uh, was referenced earlier, and it took two hours. And they transferred at one and a half hours, for example. Um, ideally, we would know that sort of information to really gauge um, the impact of increasing transfer times and, and what that would have. What, we don't have that information yet. Um, so what we really assume, based on the data we have, is that more transfers equal longer trips, and so those who make more transfers are more likely to benefit from a transfer time extension. So in our findings, this uh, first chart is looking at weekday transfer activity, comparing minority trips and non-minority trips. Um, and so we didn't find, we found that both groups, about three quarters of the time, 69% for minority trips and 73% for non-minority trips in the blue there, both groups about three quarters of the time um, have no transfer involved in their trip. So the differences ended up not being statistically significant, which is our, our policy standard for that, um, between minority and non-minority, indicating essentially transfer patterns are about the same between minority and non-minority, according to our survey data. We found the same thing on weekends um, with transfer activity. Again, about three quarters of the time, no transfer was involved, about a quarter of the time, a little, little more for minority trips, but again, didn't find a statistically significant difference. Um, however, in comparing low income and higher income trips um, with this survey data, yeah? Could you define those terms, please? 
Sure, the, the uh, statistically significant? No, or? low income and high, higher income. Yes, so low, low income is defined as uh, persons who are at or below 150% of the federal poverty level, given their annual income and household size that they reported on the survey. So comparing these two, two groups, we actually did find so higher, is anybody higher is anybody above that, yes. Um, what percentage of population would that be, you think, in, in, the, metro, in, in the, of, the, the tri -med Yeah, of, area? of the population in the service area, we have, it's about 22% are considered low income under this definition, so about 78% about, uh, higher income. Okay. Um, so we did find between these two groups, we did find some significant differences. Um, in all, uh, about 32% of trips made by low income riders involved one or two transfers. And as opposed to higher income trips on the weekdays, but that was about 25% of trips. So this showed that for low income trips, they're more likely to transfer um, once or twice on weekdays. On the weekends, similar pattern. We found it was higher for low income trips than higher income trips in terms of weather and, and how many transfers they made. So taking all this and summarizing it under the Title VI equity analysis lens, um, we concluded that there was no potential disparate impact on minority riders because both groups had similar transfer activity weekdays and weekends. So both groups equally likely to benefit from an increase in transfer times. And no potential disproportionate burden, the FTA term, again, on low-income riders, because we found a difference that low-income riders were more likely to, to transfer, and so therefore more likely to benefit from an increase in transfer times. So Jono will talk about our, our next steps for this. Great, uh, thank you, Jake. And as Director Suragosa pointed out, uh, just a couple of overview of the next steps. The first next step is uh, a review by the Transit Equity Advisory Committee uh, of this actual analysis at their meeting uh, tomorrow. Uh, we'll also submit to FTA uh, after a review of both the public as well as of TIAC a final uh, report for their consideration. And, and just a note, although this is not uh, required uh, per uh, any of the Title VI uh, requirements, uh, we want to uh, ensure uh, that we give them an additional opportunity uh, to weigh in. And of course, uh, we'll provide uh, to this body a final uh, report prior to your December meeting and your vote at that meeting. And while we are on this uh, topic of Title VI analyses, I uh, want to make sure that uh, we kind of uh, let you know uh, what's upcoming. Uh, of course, uh, we'll uh, certainly be busy producing a number of analyses. Uh, the first, of course, is looking at uh, our eFair, uh, so you'll receive an update on that uh, in short order. Uh, certainly, the Portland Milwaukee Light Rail bus service plan, uh, any Title VI impacts associated with that, and of course, analysis of uh, other FY 2016, any uh, fare or service change, changes related to that. Uh, with that, that concludes our formal remarks, and we are happy to uh, take any questions. So, Janelle, what, what, I assume you'll let us know if you hear anything back from FTA that says they're not satisfied before we get to, to December. That is correct, President Warner. Okay. And at this point, we don't know of anything FTA has said that they, they, they don't like what we've done. We saw, I thought I heard you said they'd like the... The, the scope of the analysis, but they haven't really dug into the details yet. Uh, that's correct, President Warner. I held a, a conversation with our regional civil rights officer uh, out of our regional office, and uh, that conversation uh, went well. In, in fact, he indicated that I would be able to state publicly that uh, FTA ha had no issues with our uh, equity analysis and that it looked uh, thorough, uh, but that they would be uh, taking time uh, for a much further review. Okay. All right. So the rest of the board, comments, questions? Yeah, I have a, a couple of questions. Um, just want to clarify terminology, number one. When we say no impact, that's no burden, but it's also no benefit? So I, I guess we would say if we found no disparate impact using right. the, the FTA term, 
um, the, it both means that we don't find a disproportionate negative impact right. on minority populations, but also that the benefit to minority populations is equal or greater than non-minority. Okay. Yeah. Equal or greater. Mm -hmm. So the greater it could it could be more of a benefit. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, we we heard uh, comments earlier in um, public forums a section saying that the 150 percent of poverty level was not a good choice. Why did you choose that? Uh, I'll take a stab at that. Um, that is an excellent question, and uh, you'll recall in producing our uh, Title VI program uh, that uh, went to FTA and was approved, uh, it was one of the questions we posed to uh, community members all across this region, which is how do you uh, define low income? And uh, the summary of that, we, we posed a number of options, 150%, uh, 250%, or 60% uh, medium family income, which is more of a local measure used, uh, much harder at a, at a macro level. Uh, but the summary was that 150% uh, felt like uh, the right level. Uh, the additional thing I'll state to that, uh, Director Prosser, is that's a measure that's also used uh, by uh, the Department of uh, Health and Human Services, that's sort of the, the federal standard, and by other transit properties across the country. Uh, I'll be the first to, to state that there are certainly always uh, many more folks, unfortunately, given our uh, economic inequality in this region, uh, there are always folks who fall much higher uh, in terms of income range, uh, but the challenge is always identifying uh, those who uh, uh, need it most, and uh, that's why 150% was used. Okay. And we also heard in our comments um, you know, um, a comment about data collection, saying that we need to do a better job of data collection. Um, how would we do that, and, and what are the trade-offs? Yeah, I think I think one piece that's going to be key to this is going to be the electronic fare system. Um, this sort of analysis, um, if we had it tied to demographics, would be pretty seamless if we had. Um, electronically able to see when people were transferring, how long trips were. Um, so that down the road I think will be, will be something very valuable for, for this and other information uh, regarding trip patterns. But we're also, we've also been in conversations internally about the next iteration of our, of our fare survey. Um, what that'll look like, what improvements can be made. Um, and so we're, we're definitely um, wanting to make some, some changes to how we've done things in the past and collect information that's going to be as useful as possible both for Title VI analyses, um, broader equity analyses, and then also f for use by the agency. But we uh, definitely hope to make some improvements as far as that goes. And, and the survey is a face-to-face -face writer survey? Yeah, the, w the way it was done in, in 2012 was on board. Um, uh, yeah, riders were given a, a survey to fill out and mail in with p prepaid postage, and yeah, that's how, that's how it was done then. Whether that's going to be the same in the future, given there are certain technology options like tablets, um, things like that, we'll we'll determine down the road. Yeah, I will say, you know, as you immediately went to eFair as a as a way to collect better data. Quite honestly, that's exactly where my mind went too. But as you know, being a bit of a troglodyte, that also makes me a little bit nervous, <laughs> mm -hmm. because that means we are tracking individual trips, and that that makes me very uncomfortable. So, you know, yeah, you know, being wonderful in, in the best of all possible worlds to have really great data. What's the trade-off, though? So, as we go through the eFair implementation. That's something I think we need to think about real seriously. Absolutely. <coughs> just uh, just for a refresh, you know, this data was uh, based on cash, cash fare uh, customers. What percentage of our rides are cash fare? Um, actually, I don't know that number off the top of my head. From this survey, it was about for weekdays. Well, let me let me look at the 
the ends on this. Uh, let's see. So for this survey, it was probably somewhere in the 20 to 25 percent range. Um, but whether that's reflective of our, a more accurate um, measure would be looking at our actual fare collection, um, which mm -hmm. I don't know off the top of my head what that is. Okay. We can get, we can definitely. Yeah, it'd be helpful to have that, uh, that, that little bit of data. I know we've mm -hmm. referenced it before, we've looked at it in other presentations, but uh, it'd just be something that we'd want to consider as we move into reviewing this ordinance. Uh, potentially in the future in regards to the e-fair. Uh, I think, Jake, you referenced it when you said the difference between cash pay and non-cash pay, which, you know, monthly passes and things like that, mm -hmm. uh, doesn't really matter on the transfers. Um, as, we, as I think about the future of e-fair, I think about, you know, low income. The e-fair will have a product where they basically you know, as you, as you spend a certain amount, as you spend up to the amount of a monthly pass, if I'm not mistaken, that's something we've discussed. If you spend up to the amount of a monthly pass, then it just goes to the monthly pass and you don't pay any more if you hit that date on the 15th or that amount on the 15th then they don't pay any more. So what we're talking about here actually then gets reduced as we move to the e-fare, if I'm not mistaken, because ultimately cash pay then becomes either a monthly pass at some point if they ride it that much. Yeah, and, and also uh, my understanding is one of the other cap would be uh, um, at a daily level as well so that you wouldn't pay more than $5 in a single day um, right. even if you took that. But yeah. Well, but you wouldn't pay more than $5 in a single day now. Uh, unless you... Unless you do... Cash, cash payments. Cash, yeah. That's right. Just, and yeah. Lots of single trips. That's right. right. And you're just not thinking about, you know, getting, paying the full amount. So, so essentially, as we're having this conversation and discussion, because I'm thinking in terms of, of uh, equality and everything that we're talking about here, uh, as we move to implement the e-fair, we actually will negate some of what we're discussing here at some point. The, the whole concept of transfer times, you know, as, you know, if we think about that, because if I buy, if I, if I pay 250 and I come back the same day and I pay an additional 250, that, e that gets me even closer to a monthly pass, which then, you know, the, the whole transfer time doesn't, doesn't really count if I have a, mm. if I have a, if I have a monthly pass. It's a, it's a non-issue because I can ride as many times as I need to throughout the, throughout the month at no additional cost. So as I, you know, one of, as I think about all the things that we're putting check marks by, as I think about low fare mitigation or low income mitigation, as I think about transfer times, as I continue to think about these things, the e-fare solution then gets us much, much closer to some of the concerns that I have uh, from, a, from a personal perspective of, of empowering those folks who utilize transit to improve uh, their, their, their socioeconomic status and those things. Uh, and so I'm, I'm feeling really positive about uh, the potential of what we, can, what we can implement as we move towards this e-fare. And of course, I feel positive about you know, looking at this transfer time and improving that in the interim. Director Stovall, I think that's um, an important observation. The uh, other thing I'll point out is uh, we are now in the early process of conducting Title VI analysis on uh, the general framework for, for eFair, and, and all of these questions will be explored in depth, uh, both uh, the benefits, but frankly also some of the potential trade-offs uh, as it relates to eFair. Excellent. Thank you. Now, um, I can't say it enough. Can you, your department, get all the information from across the country so we can do our Title VI analysis very quickly and, and also on the PMR, you know, just try to be ahead of the curve. And that's, I know you're not the boss, but uh, I just want to express my frustration of the people uh, who've been negatively impacted by our review. A lot of people could have been benefited in the past six, seven, eight months if they had the extended transfer. And they, it hadn't happened. So not, you didn't do it. 
but uh, you know, not everybody on this board has always been high income. So it's, uh, I'm one of them. So that stuff would have been important to me at, at that time. So uh, thank you for your work, you and, you and Jake. Thank you, Director Esmond. Thanks. I guess I just want to say thank you also for this. Um, I did notice that the question was that you asked was really related to a one-way trip. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought early on, you know, the, the, the reasons that Opal and others suggested we should do this is for, for people to take, be able to take round trip tickets. My assumption is the results would be the same if you had that information. It just feels like what you've concluded makes a whole lot of sense. So I'm not asking you to do more information or because I think this gives us enough information to move forward. But I just want to make sure I understood that correct and that is the, I think the, the so we didn't answer that question, didn't have that information. In the in the full report actually there is uh, analysis of the round tripping oh, is patterns because that, okay. that was a question on that 2012 survey. Good. Um, so you Good, okay, and great. You're right, you're right. Similar okay. conclusions. Thank you very much. So anything more than what I think we ought to do is just talk a little bit about Ordinance 332 and kind of the next steps. Uh, my assumption is you will, again, let us know how what FTA uh, tells us. I'm looking forward to hearing from TAF in terms of their recommendations and thoughts on this. Um, so let's talk about the second reading of Ordinance 332 and the timing of that. Just to remind everybody uh, who's maybe watching or listening here, um, I think getting back to some comments that Director Esmond mentioned, Ordinance 332 would increase transfer times from two hours uh, to two and a half hours, the way it's currently drafted. Um, and to remind you, we had the first reading in December 2013 on this ordinance, and then the, on January of 2014, the board voted to table the ordinance until we received further guidance from FTA, mainly because there was a civil rights complaint made by Opal that the, the previous action we had taken two years earlier than that uh, violated civil rights by, by essentially eliminating uh, a, a benefit on weekends. Um, and that fair changes were indeed, uh, excuse me, transfer time changes were indeed a fair change and needed to be looked at. And if I remember right, FTA dismissed the complaint because it wasn't timely, but uh, in essence said, yes, you're right. We think, we believe now, first time in a nation <laughs> that, uh, that uh, again, transfer times need to be considered. So we we're did, have done that work now, and I think that's probably the frustration that Director Esmond is putting here. If I, correct, if I characterize that correctly. Oh, I just th wanted to add that the FDA also found that the old regulations, the old circular applied to the actions that we had taken in June of 2012, um, and that that in part was why th there was no violation okay. as well. So, it, okay. But yes, so, you so more, there were substantive the changes too, as well as, as timing and procedural yes. things. Okay, very good. Um, so we needed to do this, this equity analysis to be ready for this. Um, having learned that answer that is yes from FTA, TriMet has been working on this existing data to come up with the report we saw today. So here's what I would suggest for us as we move forward in, in deliberations on Ordinance 332. I, so first, I think the board should direct TriMet to place the Ordinance 332 on our agenda for a second reading at our December 10th board meetings. Everybody comfortable with that? Okay. Mm -hmm. Number two, at our, at our meeting, the first order of business would then be to have a formal motion to untable Ordinance 332 so we can take action on it. Everybody understands that. The third issue is then, assuming that passes, we would then proceed to the second reading of Ordinance 332. Um, and I would also suggest, uh, fourthly, that, that we have a second public hearing on Ordinance 332 at our, at our next board meeting because Really, it's been over a year since we've heard from folks. I think we need to give people an opportunity uh, to, to weigh in again if they, if they choose to. And then finally, following the second reading and the public hearing, the board would then vote on Ordinance 332 at its December board meeting. And I guess if any, and we did, had talked about if somebody wants to make amendments to that ordinance, they can do that before we, we take the, the vote on the actual ordinance, but that would, again, delay it another at least a month, right, for us to have Started all the so we have to have two more readings. So again, I just want to make sure we understand that. Please. So when you say start over, would we also have to go back and do another transit equity analysis? Mm, no, no, it would Good. be the same. Good. 
Uh, well, I guess it would depend on how you amend the motion. There you <laughs> go. <laughs> but, but if you're just talking about extending transfer times further out than what we're contemplating in this ordinance, probably not. It would be okay. the same conclusions. So does that make sense? Everybody with me on that one? Then having that, then if, if everybody feels comfortable, I would direct the general manager to please place ordinance 332 on the agenda for, for our December uh, 10th. Uh, 2014 meeting and also to give public notice of a, of a public hearing so people know they can come give us some additional comments at that time okay absolutely again thank you very much thank you. I think we're ready to move on to our rest of our business meetings I just, so, I, I just want to say frustrated is a is a very extreme understatement okay, okay. <laughs> thank you all right so let's move on to the uh, the consent agenda uh, for anybody watching, the items on, on the consent agenda are considered routine, routine and may be approved by the board in one blanket motion. However, any board member may remove an item from the consent agenda and we will then place it on a regular agenda uh, after, after all resolutions have been considered that are on the action item now. We have two items on our, our consent agenda today, the approval of the board meeting minutes from October 22nd. 2014 and then a resolution 14-11-54 which is authorizing a modification to a contract with Wojin IS America Inc. for communication system retrofit on type 1, 2, 3 uh, light rail vehicles. So um, those are the two items. Is there any, any item a member of the board would like to have removed from the consent agenda? Okay, seeing none, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So, so moved. Second. Here, a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor of, in the motion to approve the consent agenda, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, uh, any, uh, any in a, in a, uh, objection or any abstentions? Seeing none, the motion is approved unanimously. All right, let's move on to our resolutions then. The first resolution is resolution 14-11-55, which is authorizing the board president to negotiate an employment contract renewal with the general manager and to execute the documents necessary to adjust the general manager's compensation. And so this, this is my agenda item. I think you see my name on this one, which is unusual. Uh, but uh, again, this is the way it should be. And it's my pleasure to uh, bring forward this re resolution which does uh, authorize me to negotiate a new contract with the general manager. And in the uh, staff report, you'll see that my recommendation is that the new contract include a salary increase of 3.4%, which would be retroactive to January 1, 2014, and a one-time award of 10 additional days of vacation. And I'm also proposing that we extend his contract till uh, December 31st, 2016 and maybe we can get them to continue on later than that but we'll have to do a new contract at that time um, as background I, I want everybody to understand Neil McFarland became our general manager on July 1st 2010 with a four-year contract and a base salary of two hundred fifteen thousand dollars which I do need to point out is considerably less than the previous general manager who held this position uh, enjoyed uh, this contract has been extended a few months while we completed the, the, the performance evaluation and, and brought this forward for your consideration. Uh, and I think as the board is well aware, I work with the finance and audit committee members and then, then the entire board to complete a performance evaluation of the general manager, which is attached to the resolution you have in, in your packets. And this evaluation was really based on our collective expectations and priorities. So I think there was a lot of discussion by the, the board members what we wanted to see the general manager, manager accomplish. And what I will say for the record here and for everybody watching is the board has observed that Neil has led this agency through one of its most difficult times in history, uh, through this great recession that we, uh, we had. But I'm again pleased to see that our service is up now above where we were at the beginning of that. Most recently, um, he and his staff have put this agency on a solid financial footing with the new labor contract, which was just ratified by both the union and, and this board. Uh, Neil has led the latest extension of our MAX system, the Portland Milwaukee Light Rail Project, securing project partners uh, and the federal government for $1.49 billion, uh, which is the total project cost, which is clearly going to improve transit service in, in that quarter. I want to state also that Neil, Neil restated, restarted, excuse me, and accelerated the new bus purchase program, which we we're very excited about, transforming one of the oldest fleets in the nation in, in, to an industry standards uh, in just a few years. So again, thank you for that. 
Uh, Neil's also stepped up on preventative maintenance uh, and, uh, to keep our 52-mile uh, system, MAC system, uh, in good working order, extending its life uh, and also the life of the equipment. And after several years of service cuts, as I mentioned during the group sessions, uh, Neil has made it a priority to add back bus service that has resulted in increased ridership. And, and I think really important, he's looking to the future. He's launched service enhancement plans to create, um, uh, 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 again, the, the, the future of the, uh, of, the, of the transit system here in, in, the, uh, in, in this area. And finally, since Neil took the helm, he has made safety a core value of the agency, uh, which is really consistent with, the, with one of the board's two true priorities, making significant changes, and we heard about those this morning, to ensure the safety of our riders and our employees, and we have a safer system today because of, of Neil's efforts. In summary, Neil has accomplished much in just four years to put this agency on a stable path and has built a solid foundation from which, from which we will meet the growing transit needs of our region. I base my recommendation on the board's uh, compensation philosophy where we believe that our employees should receive uh, total compensation that's competitive uh, with the market. And Neil's only salary increase at general manager took, took place on July 1st, 2012 with an increase at that time of 3%. As you know, uh, also in the packets, uh, the board hired a compensation consulting firm, a national firm that does this on a regular basis, Milliman Incorporated, to conduct a market uh, study of the general manager position. Uh, as detailed in the resolution uh, cover memo and attached report from Milliman, the consultant found that while our general manager's base salary uh, is notably lower than the market, when total compensation is considered, including retirement benefits, the general manager is just about 3.4% below the market. And so that's where I pegged the number. So again, with Neil performing at this high level, a 3.4% increase to bring him in line with the market is appropriate and I believe clearly justified. Um, for the record, this would increase uh, Mr. McFarland's annual base salary from $221,450 to $229,000. The one-time one uh, vacation uh, 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 accrual addition of 10 days of vacation would occur in a first payroll period in two, two, uh, 2015 and have a value of, of uh, $8,807. $8, um, I do want to quote, when I looked at the newspaper article this morning from the Oregonian, um, I was surprised them to see them talking about the $57,000 of actuarially uh, de derived numbers for benefit as part of the compensation. I know that the, the compensation, that total compensation that we give you, Neil, um, that's directly attributed to your, your salary is probably thirty-five dollars to $40,000 less than is reported in the newspaper. I know we've had a discussion with them, uh, but I just think it's unfortunate they, they, they don't understand it or want to take the time to understand that. Um, also, I want everybody to understand this is the look back. This is a review of what Neil has done for a little over the last two years, uh, two and a half years, and, uh, and I think the, the board is very pleased with the performance that he's made uh, on, on his work plan. And the next step after we hopefully take action on this is for me to work with the board to establish what we want to see Neil work on for the next couple years so we can gauge his performance at the end of next fiscal year and then finally at the end of the contract period that we have here. So with that, that's, the, that's, the, uh, that's my, my staff report to you on this item. I'd be glad to answer any questions, and staff is here to help me answer any questions if you'd like. Or it's time for the board if you want to make some comments or, or have other questions, I'll entertain those too at this time. So I'm looking to the board. Okay. Yeah. Um, I will be voting in, in favor of this um, measure. I think uh, we've been fortunate to have Neil in charge during a very difficult time. Um, you know, he's epitomized grace under pressure. Um, I think the other, I think, relating to a point uh, our president made about the newspaper article this morning, um, there were a lot of things in that article that I think gave very inaccurate information um, and was very good at. Um, listing all the problems that we've encountered over the past few years, what it didn't bother to address at all was all of the corrective measures. And 
yes, there can be problems, but I think the, the real issue is how, does, how do people step up to deal with those problems and correct uh, procedures and, and activities so those problems don't occur again. And Neil has been excellent at doing that. Um, I th and I think he's um, served this agency well, he served the, the region well, and so I'm very comfortable in um, voting in favor of, of this measure. Good, Dr. Stovall. So I, with Director Prosser, will be voting in favor of this, of this resolution, and we've had an opportunity to do a thorough review of a lot of data information that doesn't necessarily, didn't necessarily get shared uh, in regards to all the data information that gets summarized and then uh, delivered, uh, but this was a thorough review of the opportunity to take a look at Neil and his performance, and then also the compensation that's required for a person of this role who runs a half a billion dollar corporation and organization it, whether or not it's private or public. I mean, there's, there's tons of constraints. I mean, there's tons of responsibilities that go with that. When I think about, you know, what I've seen over the last two, uh, just to, actually two and a half years, time flies when you're having fun, <laughs> is uh, I think first and foremost, the strategic financial plan is something that I'm very proud to be a part of this uh, board and to, to be a part of the outcome that was produced with the strategic financial plan. And the the, the collaboration that existed with the groups and the organizations and the stakeholders that exist in this region as we roll that out and we put that together it gives us some great guidelines and direction over the next 20 to 30 to 40 years as we move forward. I think about the increased collaboration and the transparency that has happened over the last two and a half years and under Neil's, under Neil's leadership. You know, we consistently try to move towards making sure that we're accountable to the folks and the stakeholders that we work with. I think about the Secretary of State, the Secretary of State's audit. I think about all the things that you know, that they said, hey, you've got, you've, you've got these challenges, but you're certainly moving towards addressing these challenges. And, and this is an, uh, an outside organization that came in and did another, another thorough audit of what we're up to and the things that we're challenged by. And those are identified well before the Secretary of State came in and pointed them out even further and, and verified and validated the concerns that, uh, that we have and we're moving forward with. I think about labor relations. And, and the work that we're doing and Neil's leadership is doing there. I think about the financial audit that we just received, I think, was it last month? And the report there, and this is, again, is a third-party outside organization that came and said it's one of the fastest audits we've ever done with a public agency and one of the cleanest that we've ever done for a public agency in that regard. Again, that speaks to the leadership. I think about implementing a, a very, very large capital project in the Portland-Milwaukee light rail. Uh, there's lots of things that have gone on with that, and you would think that doing a, a, a project of $1.4 billion in and of itself and accomplishing it on time and under budget is something that we'd be proud of, but I just listed a number of other things that have been going on during that same time frame that have needed to be dealt with, and we've been able to move forward. And, you know, so at this point, you know, I, we talked about those things, but one of the biggest things that we're, we're now taking a look at is reliability of the system and the state of good repair. And that's something that I think Neil and, and the leadership team is already out in the forefront and uh, having an opportunity to take a look at that to make sure that not only are we building uh, new components of this system, but we're also saying, okay, one of the most important things to our riders and our stakeholders that have, they have told us is on-time performance. And on-time performance, is it weighs heavily on the reliability and state of, of good repair of our system. That's something he, we're already getting leadership provided. You know, in the, uh, I'll wrap this up and summarize by saying, you know, some of the challenges I think that uh, we deal with as a board, Neil deals with as, as uh, the general manager, uh, are somewhat inherited sometimes. And it's not that, you know, some of these things weren't, uh, didn't get dealt with, it's just some of them as they begin to grow, we don't know the outcomes. We don't know the eventual place that they're going to get to by the time we get to see them, by the time we get to deal with them. And some of these things are things that uh, you know, are fairly uh, big issues to deal with. And I think that uh, Neil has taken those challenges head on. And that's what really has impressed me as a board member and as a, as a community member and as a stakeholder is that he's not looking at things and saying, I don't want to deal with that today. We're really taking those key issues and putting them in the forefront and, and getting them dealt with. Not every time will they be dissatisfaction with everybody around the table. But uh, you know, we, we work on it, we move these things forward, and that's what's really impressed me 
And again, uh, the, the review that we've done uh, was one that was uh, we've uh, was independent. I mean, we had the opportunity to spend time with Milliman and uh, as a board all by ourselves to ask any of the hard questions we wanted to. And I spent and we spent a, a number of, uh, of of I think I spent about an hour just on the phone individually, having the conversation with their lead person, uh, asking a lot of questions, giving my perspective and my input before we got the final recommendation on the table. So I'm I am confident that the board is is weighing in with their own perspective as to where we go with this. And again, I want to thank Neil for his phenomenal leadership and uh, I want to thank the team for also for the leadership that they provide. Please. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> you may not have to say it all again. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, um, I would just like to say that the years that I've been on the board, um, there have been many challenges and I agree um, where maybe we're not always in, in total agreement the path that has been taken to resolve uh, many of the issues, especially around uh, the transfer time, and I know we're coming back to that next month, but also our labor negotiations, um, you know, the PMLR and all of the questions with the communities there. Um, I've really appreciated that, and it's not always easy. And also, to be able to do a fair market analysis in terms of of individuals in like positions I think was really important and really shows that we were below and hopefully will continue to to move that where it needs to be so thank you mm -hmm. all right did all one two and three <laughs> and four. Okay. Um, I have appreciated everything that has been done and what has been accomplished for TriMet during this tenure um, under Neil and also, I guess, would like to say, if something, and I say this a lot within my own um, work that I do, and I say this often to people who work with me and for me, if you were not doing anything, nobody would say anything about you. <laughs> but because you are doing something, people are looking for something to say and to pick at. But if you're just straight out, I don't have any issue with you. I also want to just reinforce again that what the board has done and the steps that were taken has been um, extensive, yet needed, to guarantee and ensure that we've come to a very fair and equitable decision. And in no way, during the time that we have worked on this, I will say this for myself, and I believe it's true for the whole board, did we ever have any discussions with the general manager about what he wanted to have, and where he wanted to be, nor did he give us any directions as to you've got to do this or do that or else. It has solely been what this board has looked at and determined is the best course of action for the organization at this time. I can't top the good doctor. <laughs> Or Travis. Thanks, Neil. Yeah. This is a very, to me, very fair compensation, and uh, you've exceeded. <clears throat> uh, I can see. Great job. Right. Thank you. All right. With that, then, do I hear a motion, I a motion? to approve Resolution 14? I'll second it. 1155. I'm hearing <laughs> that right here. I guess I Where don't have to get it out here. <laughs> Any further discussion on the resolution? All right, all those in favor of the motion to approve resolution 14-11-55 signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the motion is approved unanimously. I too, uh, Neil, would like to say thank you for what you do. And, and if anybody watching this on TV doesn't understand, this board is not going to just kick the can down the road. And we, in lockstep with the general manager, are attacking the issues, frankly, that needed to be attacked for a long time, and I'm pleased to see that we're knocking those issues off, off of the list and look forward to working with you on uh, the next priorities for the next couple of years, Neil. Thanks. All right, let's move on to Resolution 14-11-56, which is regarding amendment to TriMet uh, Section 457 Deferred Compensation Plan. Mr. General Manager, we're going to have, have Randy Stedman come up and do this one. Board President, members of the board, I'm sort of speechless, so thank you very oh. much. But uh, so I'm going, and as a result, I'll ask uh, Mr. Stedman to actually get the staff report on this one. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. 
And may I say I'm glad to be here on something other than a labor matter. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I bet you are. <laughs> I didn't hear that. <laughs> Uh, this is a, uh, a proposal to amend uh, for the first time the 457 uh, plan, the deferred compensation plan in which all TriMet employees are eligible to participate in. This plan was amended and restated in total, uh, effective 1 1 2014, and this would be the first amendment. Since its uh, adoption earlier, which this board has the power to adopt and amend, uh, there have been a number of technical changes uh, pursuant to IRS guidance that uh, we would like to address and make changes to bring the plan in compliance with that guidance. And also one uh, change to uh, allow for the uh, contribution, uh, non-elective non em uh, employer contributions to the, defined, to the uh, 457 plan for uh, crude sick leave that otherwise would be forfeited upon uh, separation. So the technical changes to the plan are to uh, uh, put into the plan procedures to ensure that rollover contributions are valid. Uh, so the administration of the plan would have to in, uh, implement those procedures to ensure that those rollover contributions um, are valid rollovers and that uh, rollovers may be taken uh, into the plan f directly from IRA providers would be another technical change to the plan. Um, it would also provide that if there were distributions uh, uh, to an employee that's a member of the plan while on military leave, there couldn't be any non-elective employer contributions uh, to the plan on that member's behalf for six months. And finally, the other, the last technical plan is that uh, an individual who wants to make a claim against the plan for benefits must exhaust administrative uh, procedures uh, before filing suit. And then finally, again, the other change that w is in this resolution is to permit employer non-elective contributions of accrued sick leave that otherwise would be forfeited upon separation to be uh, contributed to the plan. That would this w plan would allow for that, it wouldn't trigger that. In other words, there would have to be some future uh, board action or policy action on behalf of TriMet to allow that. But this allows for that a possibility. It's a, pr a provision that's uh, similar to one that we have in the 401A plan currently, and it's fairly common among these kinds of plans uh, generally in public uh, sector em employers. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions? Just a statement. I'm very confused, and this probably <laughs> this probably isn't the time to ask these questions. They're probably more detailed than. Um, I just want to be sure what I'm voting on, and it's. Are you not feeling comfortable today moving forward? Then I'm not comfortable. No, okay. but I'm not uncomfortable. Okay. <laughs> okay. But. Well, are the, thing, are the issues you got, can you, do you want to? No. Do you want to get some additional time with him after, afterwards? Yes. Okay. All right. Yes. All right. Yes. All right. I mean, uh, provisionally, I would vote yes if, okay. uh, and once I get clear in my mind. Yeah, if you have some issues, we can come back and, and look at. I, I don't live and breathe this like some, so. <laughs> I think that's all of us, so, so congratulations well. on that one. Uh, all right, so I'm, other questions or concerns? Okay. Well, then. Is there a motion to approve resolution 14-11-56? So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. I will point out it's okay to abstain or, or vote no if you're, if you're not feeling comfortable, uh, Director Esmond, okay? All right. Mm -hmm. With no further discussion, then I'm going to uh, call for a vote. All those in favor of the motion to approve resolution 14-11-56, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Any, any abstentions? I'll abstain. All right, all right, very good. So the motion is approved uh, with one abstention. Thank you very much. And hopefully you can get together with Director Esmond and if there's some issues, you can come back to us with some, any? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. All right, um, I believe that we're at the end of our business meeting. Is there any other business that's gonna be coming to the board that we know of? All right, then I'm going to adjourn the meeting and, and maybe we should take a five minute break 
and uh, come back for our board uh, briefing agenda. We have three items on that agenda, which we can get to, and maybe we can get us out of here by noon, okay? Thank you. Mr. President, just to let the other board members know, I have a conflict.